From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. And now here is our host and producer, Hilda Labrada Gore. Hey, Hilda here. Did you know that four corporations are responsible for the majority of beef that we buy in the United States? And that most of the meat on our dinner plates has traveled thousands of miles to get there? This is episode 446, and our guest today is A.J. Richards. A.J. is a combat veteran, an entrepreneur, and the CEO of Sustenance Earth, an online marketplace that connects consumers to local food producers. He's also simply a man on a mission. He is working to help the public understand the fragility of our food supply chain and how to gain control over it to enhance food security. Today, in particular, we focus on the beef industry and why we need to shake things up. AJ discusses the current monopoly of said industry and how the centralization is compounding issues in our national U.S. food system. He points out that the U.S. imports a larger percentage of beef than ever before, at the same time exporting beef to other countries with an American price tag. This results in the meat on our plate having traveled halfway around the world to get there while running local sustainable farms into the ground. AJ takes a personal turn at the end of this conversation, telling us of a confrontation that his family had with the Bureau of Land Management that wanted to take their land. For each of us, AJ reminds us that the best bet for improved health and food sovereignty and security is to meet our local rancher and buy their beef. Before we get into the conversation, are you curious about the safety of raw milk? Are you wondering about its availability near you? Go to realmilk.com. It is a source of reliable information on real raw milk. There are articles, blogs, posts, videos, even podcasts that explain why raw milk is healthy, its amazing benefits, and where you can get it in the United States. You'll also find insights on the politics and economics of raw milk and the industrial dairy system. Go to realmilk.com for more resources. This is Hilda Labrada Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, AJ. Thanks for having me. So I met you recently in Utah, and we were talking in the car about our food system. Talk to me about the four main groups that control our beef in the U.S. right now. So we've got the four meat packers that is really the biggest concern is JBS, Cargill, National Beef, and Tyson. Two of those are foreign owned entities actually. And what does it mean that they control so much of the beef industry? Well, when it's centralized the way it is, it gives us an unstable food supply chain, right? We kind of saw an experience of that during COVID. It really highlighted what centralization has done because depending on where you were, if you were in a large city, for example, you'd go to the grocery store and there would be a very limited supply of meat, if any. And so how are these companies causing that scarcity? Well, because the control has gone to these four entities over time, we've actually lost about 40% of our small farms and ranches since 2000 because of the shift in where the revenue was going, right? They have this conversation, vote with your dollars. Well, this is the result of that. So these big four companies are taking all of these food dollars, which means the small farm and ranch can't survive. The way that that works is at the auction level. So you have what's called a cow-calf operation, which is most common in the U.S., which means the rancher will raise calves and then take them to auction at a certain age and weight, and then they sell them, and the buyers are the big four. Because of the size of these companies, they really can manipulate and control the prices at the auction house because they're the ones buying the majority of that inventory. We've seen examples of this where it's kind of like this eight-year swing. Every eight years, the prices for the producer will go sky high, and then they make a lot of money, and then all of a sudden, they feel like things are going to get better, and then the next year or two, the bottom drops out, and we lose a lot more farms and ranches, and it, you can trace it and track it to the buying habits of the major corporations. It's also tied to the importations of cattle or beef that's happening as well. So right now, I think we're at the highest percentage of imported beef that we've seen in a long time. I couldn't tell the exact number. I just read this article recently, which means they're bringing beef in from other countries. That means we're not buying beef here or we're not buying as much beef here. 
And so that's changing the prices in the auction again because they went really high because of inventory shortages. So these companies now can just pivot and buy it cheaper from a foreign country like Brazil or South Africa, import it in, cut and wrap it and send it out to the American consumer. So this is kind of mind boggling. In other words, we are exporting some of our meat or a lot of meat and then we're importing other amounts because it all has to do with the bottom line, which is money for these companies. Yeah, that's right. And if you look, you'll see that the import poundage of beef is equal almost exactly to what we export. So what's happening is they're buying cheaper cattle in a foreign country, selling it at American prices once they get it here. Then they're buying American cattle at lower prices because they can manipulate it, the price. And then because it carries the American brand, they send it to a foreign country and they can sell it for more. And so it's always about manipulating the market to feed their bottom line or to increase their share value. And going back to what you were saying earlier about the auction, you were telling me before about the experience that a a small rancher might have where he goes in, let's say he's trying to play with the big dogs and buy cattle and the other guys just keep bidding it up. It's almost like a game to them, right? They can squeeze the small rancher out. Yeah, really. And this was a particular gentleman who built a slaughterhouse and had a feedlot where he could go buy cattle at the auction and feed them out and then run them to his slaughterhouse and try to play in that field. Really, if you have the power to do that, that's smart business. But when you're only looking at it for the revenue fact, you're not looking at the downstream consequences for humanity, for the consumer audience in America, because that's not even in your consideration. It's about how do I drive the most profit? So as that is your only measurement of success, they're doing a really good job. And so that's what will happen is this particular gentleman would go to the auction to buy. And because they have so much money, they would just bid until the cost of those cows went so high that either that rancher or that feedlot owner paid more than they were worth just to have something go through his supply chain to keep his people in business, his employees, or they would just win the bid and he wouldn't get any and go home empty handed. And to them, they've got enough money in their coffers that they can wait that game out. Well, and so why should the average consumer care that these four companies kind of are dominating the beef industry market? That's a good question. On one hand, the average consumer benefits because they're keeping the cost of beef so low, but that's a short term benefit because we are losing our small farms and ranches. The other side of that is that they don't care about the end consumer and their health. They care about the profit. And so there are reports now of microplastics making its way into our beef because you can see instances if you just do a little bit of research because of feed prices being so high, corn and grain is really high right now in price. And that's because nitrogen prices, fertilizer prices are through the roof. So every, all of the commodities that's used to fatten cattle in these big feedlots have costs have increased. So to cut corners, they'll feed these cattle waste products like packaged candy bars and Twinkies and so forth. And when they go feed them to the cattle, they won't take them out of the wrapper because that would be labor hours. Instead, they throw all of that packaging included into big grinders, grind it up and then mix it in the feed. And now cattle are eating plastic. I've never heard of this before, AJ. This is crazy. Yeah, it's not okay. No wonder cancer rates are skyrocketing in our country. Chronic health rates are skyrocketing in our country. It's because our food system is solely focused on revenue, not what it should have been focused on, which is quality of life and giving high quality nutrients to the population of that particular region, wherever this we're discussing this. And for the cattle too, I'm just thinking they shouldn't be fed candy bars. Humans shouldn't eat them, but neither should the animals. Yeah, exactly. And so when you look at cattle that are finished in a feedlot, and I want to be sensitive to this because we have put ourselves in a situation as a country where the amount of food that we're producing is somewhat necessary, although most of us realize that we waste 40% of our food that's produced. So if we could handle that problem, we would actually be producing enough food. But what happens is a cow that goes to a feedlot where they're fed corn and grain, it's basically fast track to getting big enough to slaughter. And so you can process an 18 month old cow in a feedlot versus something fed on pasture. Naturally, they're not at a weight for that process until 25 to 30 months or more because it's a natural growth. So if you actually compare those animals side by side, 
an animal in a feedlot, if you kept giving it that same diet every day, they will die under chronic health issues, essentially, just like the American food diet within a couple of years. They won't last long on that ration versus a cow on grass, barring any predator involvement, will live 25 years. So essentially, when you're eating a grass-fed and finished or regeneratively raised animal, you're eating a healthy animal versus if you're eating one that's been fattened on corn and grain, maybe given antibiotics because it's living in its own feces with thousands of other cattle, that's what you're getting in the meat there. And of course, that's not good for the human body. How did you learn so much about this? My family have been in ranching for a long time. They're cow-calf guys. But in 2020, when the food supply chain broke, I was worried about my children and their future and my grandchildren. So I just really made it my mission to find a solution for our current food supply chain, one that would support the small farms and ranchers and really put the consumer in a place where they could shake the hand that feeds them. Okay. And so when you had that aha, when you started thinking about the future of your children and your grandchildren, I know your children are young, so it's going to be a minute before the grandchildren come along. But when you had that aha, how did you roll up your sleeves and get involved? It's been a process. It's really, it's been a lot of personal development, wondering if I'm the right guy, because who am I to really take this on? I mean, we're talking about a food system that's been in place in its current state since the 1980s. So what would this guy, me, know to do. So a big part of that's been the personal development. And then I just started studying, listening. I've made it my intention to shake the hand of every expert at every angle. And so I'm not committed to being right. I'm committed to getting it right. And that means interviewing and meeting as many people at different stages of this process as possible. And to be quite honest, sometimes I'll meet somebody that will adjust my viewpoint of what I've learned up to this point. Because again, I'm committed to really the ultimate outcome, which is saving our small farms and ranches, encouraging a new agrarian movement. In other words, getting more people back into agriculture to offset what we've lost, and then seeing how that affects the health of the humans around me, the health of the people in our communities, both physically and mentally. And so it's just been a process of learning. And what have you seen so far? Have you seen anything that gives you hope? Yes, I have. I'm working on some projects of my own to connect consumers and producers, but what gives me hope is I'm not the only one. I believe in abundance, not scarcity. Scarcity is what got us in the position we're in. When you want to be the dominating business and have no other person participate, to me, that's actually a scarcity mindset because that means there's not enough for others. And if you really looked at this in a holistic point of view, you know, holistic land management is a movement by Alan Savory, but even in your decision-making processes, holistically, you would say, well, at some point, if I'm the only one, we've created a destabilized food supply chain. And that's not holistic. So maybe I shouldn't take out all of my competitors and actually see them thrive. Because at the end of the day, there's 327 million people in our country that need to eat. So what's really encouraging to me is I'm not the only one working on this now. 2020 woke up a lot of people to, in many different areas of our society that are not working, and there's active participants trying to change those things. In the food space, I've seen quite a few new ideas come into the table that I think the days are numbered for the big four. They're going to go out gnashing and gnarling their teeth, I'm sure, because that that's how it has to be. I get it. But there's some new things coming that I'm really excited for. Wow. Can you tell us about some of the new things that are giving you hope? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I've been working on a project to use technology, software as a service to rethink the way we source our food. And like what Airbnb did with short-term rentals. And so I'm going to apply that same methodology to almost like a digital farmer's market. So if you own a small farm or ranch, or even if it's a larger one, and you want to get your product direct to the consumer, or if you're a consumer who would like to shake the hand that feeds you, you can open this platform and instantly be connected with everybody around you that's raising food so you can get to know your food supply. I mean, human beings are dependent on three major things, food, shelter, safety. I put water in with food, but food being the most important one. And we have forsaken that as a society, not knowing the source of that, we become disconnected. So I've seen multiple people wanting to do that same idea and everybody's going to go about it their own way and they'll be successful in their own niches, but that will start giving us many other places to source our meat from or our produce or dairy or whatever that's grown other than having to go to a big corporate store. Coming up, 
AJ talks about the confrontation that his family had with the Bureau of Land Management, and he also points out what is contributing to the collapse of local sustainable farms. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Paleo Valley. Paleo Valley has an apple cider vinegar product, a supplement that gives you all the healing properties of apple cider vinegar without all of the fuss or burn. Why take it? Apple cider vinegar supports digestion, breaking down proteins for better absorption, and it improves the blood sugar response and helps fight cravings. The main ingredient, acetic acid, supports the extraction of nutrients from food for use by the body. And Paleo Valley, in this apple vinegar cider complex, they combine healing spices like turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, and lemon for added digestive benefits. So go to paleovalley.com slash wise to get 15% off your first order and check out their apple cider vinegar complex and other products on their site. Again, that's paleovalley.com slash wise to get 15% off your first order. And Optimal Carnivore. Brain Nourish is a revolutionary new product from Optimal Carnivore. It combines grass-fed beef brain and lion's mane mushrooms in a groundbreaking formula. It is the ultimate whole food no tropic to build a better brain. These two ancestral superfoods have been used for centuries to improve brain function and overall mental well-being. They're now available for the first time together in convenient capsules, and they're guaranteed to have your brain firing on all cylinders for supreme focus, elevated mood, improved memory, greater clarity, and enhanced creativity. There are many more benefits, too, that include shoring up your health, vitality, and longevity, thanks to these highly nutritious superfood ingredients. So go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore to explore this product, Brain Nourish, and their other products, grass-fed organ complex, grass-fed liver, bone and joint restore, and more. That's amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code Weston10 to get 10% off of all products. Again, that's amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and the code Weston10. This is Hilda Labrata Gore and you're listening to Wise Traditions. This is important because what was highlighted in 2020, as you mentioned earlier, was the fragility of our food system and the infrastructure. So talk to us about how our food dollars are spent right now and how it continues to be fragile. Yeah, great question. So it's estimated that one in four dollars spent on food is spent at Walmart right now. Walmart? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And that's one in four. That's such a high percentage going to one company. And I met somebody who worked in their supply chain division at the corporate level. And he said they have internal conversations where they acknowledge that if their supply chain broke, America would be out of food in three days. And people will say, well, there's more stores than just Walmart. But what's being missed there is if they get one in four dollars, that means those other stores are out of food within minutes if that supply chain broke. And then there's no more coming. And so... When we don't use our dollars wisely, when we think of our food dollars as, you know, one of the things Americans have been led towards in many cases is the path of least resistance or comfort or instant gratification. And so what that leads to is, well, I can go buy these highly processed foods and save money. So I have more spending money, or even if you don't have extra spending money, but I'm going to save money on my food, but I'm paying all these other fees in my health. I'm buying medications, even if it's mental health, like anxiety and depression, we know that that's a chronic health disease that can be cured by food, highly nutritious, locally raised, regenerative, organic, whatever buzzword you want to use food that can cure those things. But we don't associate that. We think I'm going to save money on food, but then I'm spending all this money on my health care. And so we used to spend 30% of our budget on food and 8% on health care. It's switched. We're spending 8% of our budget on food and 30% or more on healthcare. And so voting with your dollars now makes sure, first of all, that you even have access to it later because we supported our small farms and ranches, right? Because that's the reality. There are countries right now going through experiences and you can look at history where they didn't support local ag. The Holodomor of the Soviet Union in 1932 to 33, millions of people died in one season because of whether it was an intentional by Stalin or poor management, they ran out of food in one season. So voting with your food dollars, first of all, make sure it's there. And second of all, make sure that you're healthy in your later years. So you said make sure it's there. 
talk to us about how many ranches there are who are actually doing it right, regeneratively and sustainably. Honestly, I would say it's very few that are doing it right, but it's growing. Things like Alan Savory's work and Kiss the Ground documentary that was on Netflix, and then they're going to come out with a second one called Common Ground here very soon. They're starting to reach the consumer population and they're starting to make a different shift into what they're doing. So that's growing even though there's not enough right now. That's why I say this is a process. We've been doing this in our supply chain since 1980. And specifically what happened is Reagan changed the antitrust laws, which allowed what the big four only had 25% control of the market. Now they have 85 because they were able to keep buying up smaller companies. So beef alone is a $64 billion a year industry and four companies get 85% of that. That means they leave the rest of the population 15% to scrap over. And that's why we're losing our food supply. And that's why when their plants shut down, like what happened with COVID specifically was the meat processing plant shut down because everybody had to go home because of COVID. Well, that created this downstream effect. But because we've been so dependent on one slaughterhouse that can slaughter 3,000 animals in a day versus the smaller mom and pops regionally throughout our cities and towns and country, when they closed, we had nobody producing beef because it's all gone to the big guys on a large scale. If we get back to a decentralized supply chain where we have small mom and pops all over the country, we can self-sustain. We don't waste as much food. We start looking at sustainable practices like regenerative and holistic management. We process at a local level. We don't have to haul it as far. By the way, now we're not contributing to the carbon emissions issue. Talk about agriculture being the major factor on carbon and global warming is false. It's the decisions based on the corporations are making on how we get our food is the problem. It's the mechanized movement of our food around the planet that's the issue. You know, we talk about the import export when we're moving billions of pounds of meat by massive shipping containers on the sea, which one super tanker is equal to 40,000 cars. That's why there's a saying it's not the cow, it's the how. It's how we're getting our food. The average steak travels somewhere around 1,500 miles before it lands on your plate. But almost everybody listening to this can drive within minutes and see a cow standing in a pasture. If that's how you were sourcing it, I'm using air quotes, global warming, really it's a desertification issue. We fix our emissions and our carbon issue. We're increasing forage that's drawing down carbon. We're feeding our people more healthy food because they're buying it locally. And we just solve a lot of issues that way. It's kind of like Charles Eisenstein says, like we're going to create a parallel society or a parallel economy where in terms of food, we're getting our beef right where we live. And so we're solving so many problems at once. But I get the feeling these four companies aren't going to go down without a fight. So when they start seeing their profits go down, how do you think they're going to try to turn things around? Oh, that's a great question, because truthfully, that's I'm already considering that, even though I'm just a little gnat in the window right now, because <laughs> we're just getting started. But I believe that myself or somebody doing this is going to be successful to help our people. It'll be regulation. They'll use lobbyists to regulate these concepts of buying locally out of business. Actually, just yesterday, I read an article that the USDA is now looking at buying a cow share illegal, which means a lot of farms and ranches right now, what they do is I have a cow. You would like to buy some of that. We don't have a USDA meat processing facility around us. So you have to buy a portion of a share of that animal before it goes to slaughter. So you might buy a quarter. The next neighbor buys a quarter. And two other people buy a quarter. That's how we can support a localized food system. Well, they're trying to outlaw that. I have a strong feeling that a big part of that is because of lobbying that's happening behind the scenes because they see the trend of going local even now. So our biggest threat will be regulatory. That's why it's important that I am not the only one doing this because if I'm the only one and we're the only concept out there to do this decentralized food buying, it's an easy target. They can wipe it out really quickly. That's really the biggest threat we see coming. And I sense the passion in your voice, AJ. And I also know that personally, your family had to kind of fight some big agency from the government that was trying to take your land. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? I will. And I'll be sensitive to the fact that I wasn't there personally, but I've had enough conversations to at least get you over the bullseye. So my family are the Bundy ranchers that went head to head with the Bureau of Land Management in the ag world. That was the first BLM organization. <laughs> so the BLM, they had grazing rights to a particular area in Mesquite and they've had them since the late 1800s. There was some disputes on 
if they were being paid, which again, I know they were, but there's some details around that that you should hear from the family themselves. But ultimately what happened or came out was that there were people in Congress trying to sell that land to China for a solar farm. But before that came out, there was a full on almost Waco style showdown. You saw the internet. You're going to find whatever evidence you want to find for whatever side you want to find. I'm just telling you as a relative, this is what I know. And now we see long-term results. This was 2014. It's now 2023. And we can see that that was definitely some agendas happening at that time. So it was a Western showdown. You had cowboys on horseback carrying the American flag with six shooters on their hips. And then you had fully outfitted park rangers and Bureau of Land Management agents with sniper rifles and AR-15s on the other side. And Ultimately, it was a peaceful surrender by the Bureau of Land Management side. And my family went in, rounded up what cattle was left. They found mass grave sites where they had executed a decent number of their cattle. It wasn't ethical at all. They destroyed a lot of watering points that they had built over the decades to help the wildlife there thrive in the desert. And then their cattle, of course, thrive in the desert. Those were all destroyed. And then a few years later, there was another showdown where a gentleman was killed. Now, Speaking to the other side of that, I was in a self-development seminar while all that was happening and the general public couldn't really get behind what was happening because the news focused on the armed militia that was there. And they did. They had volunteer militia show up to protect my family while they worked to expose the corruption that was happening at the federal level. When the Molner Monument or Bird Aviary, I can't remember the exact ter- uh, detail of that site in Oregon, when that all went down... They basically set up a sting operation, and you can see all this on drone footage. They got run off the road into the snow. Lavoie gets out of the truck and gets shot and killed. My family are then arrested and put in prison for two years. They were political prisoners, and the reason that I'm so firm on that is because two years later, the judge looked at the prosecuting attorneys, the government's attorneys, and said, you have corrupted this case so bad that I can't try it. Everybody's acquitted. If there was real evidence of wrongdoing, then the prosecuting attorneys wouldn't have had to lie about anything. They wouldn't have had to be so corrupt that it was even just completely thrown out. So I'm not going to argue over semantics, but I've seen this happening to the small farm and ranch my entire life, watching these organizations sue to have land removed or water rights removed to reduce cattle herds because they think they're the problem. If you study Alan Savory stuff, you'll know that the only solution to desertification in the West are more ruminating animals, more cattle or more bison, whatever you want to put out there. We just need millions more to reverse desertification. So the cows are not the problem. It is management. And I will say that some producers need to see their side of that too, that there's some new ways to manage that are actually better for the environment. But by and large, it's a management issue, not a cow issue which is what we rely on for food. Well, fantastic. You've given us some great insights. And I know that you said it's good for us to vote with our dollar, find out who's producing beef properly in our area and support them and I guess be ready for anything. But I want to ask you now the question I often pose at the end here. If the listener could do one thing to improve their health, AJ, what would you recommend that they do? Eat more meat. Contrary to maybe a lot of belief, (laughs) and somebody (laughs) might be hearing this and you might be vegan or vegetarian, I honor you and respect you for that choice. But if you're asking me and it's my turn, I'm going to say eat more meat. But what I do want to say specifically though, because it's a very hard time in our country right now and people don't have a lot of money. So I want to share what I've been trying to share with a lot of people that are on a tight budget. Most people don't understand there's this term in the the cattle industry called a cull cow, C-U-L-L. What that means is it's a cow that's being retired. So it's an older cow. Maybe it's a cow that's not having calves anymore. Maybe it's a cow that never had a calf. So it might be young. It just never could get pregnant. It could be a bull that's no longer producing calves. And so they're culling that from the herd. That's the term cull. Those are typically a lot cheaper of an animal to buy. So if you're on a budget, find your local farmer and rancher, and you might shock them when you actually ask for the cull cow because marketing trains us to buy what we think we want to buy. Cull cows are healthy. In many cases, they've lived on the range their whole lives and they're probably the most healthy cow. Now, because of its age, it may not be as tender and it may not be as flavorful. But if you grind that animal up into ground beef, you have taco seasonings you can put in there, you have burger seasonings you can put on there, and you can get really healthy, nutrient-dense meat on a budget. 
Just don't be picky. My family, our fridge is full, freezer is full of a cold cow because we understand that we eat for the nutrients, not for the flavor all the time. If I want a really juicy steak, I'll go to a steakhouse and ask them where they first source it, but I'll go to a steakhouse for that. But in my home daily, what I care about is the nutrients of the food I'm eating. Fantastic advice. AJ, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to meet you too. Our guest today was AJ Richards. You can visit his website, feedthepeoplebythepeople.com to learn more. And I'm Hoda Labrador, the host and producer of this podcast for the Weston A. Price Foundation. You can find me and my resources at holistichilda.com. And for the transcript for this podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent review from Apple Podcasts from Lani of Greener Postures. And she called it top notch. Lani said, great show, interesting topics, and well hosted with an even head and gentle tone. Thank you for all the great episodes. Lani, it is our pleasure. You too can rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts, or if it's easier, just send a link of an episode to a friend and get the word out about this health and life-saving information. And thank you so much for listening, my friends. Stay well, and remember to keep your feet on the ground and your face to the sun. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.